Good morning. Uh, first, I want to thank you all for coming, uh, you know, waking up early to come to this program. Um, this uh, program is going to be on pulmonary arteriovenous malformations, addressing the, the disease, the economic burden, and best treatment options. I uh, really have a great panel here. I really want to um, introduce uh, everybody here. But first, my name is uh, Rupal Gandhi. I'm at Miami Cardiac and Vascular Institute. We have Sanjeeva Kalva sitting uh, to my left from Massachusetts General Hospital. Um, next, we have Cliff Weiss from uh, Johns Hopkins. And finally, Miles Conrad from UCSF. Um, I want to thank Medtronic uh, for supporting this program with an educational grant. Um, and this, uh, this session is approved for one unit of CME and CNE credit. Um, you know, we're, we're kind of, I know it's a little bit hard to make these sessions a little bit interactive, but you know, we're trying in this kind of roundtable format. If you do have some questions along the way, you know, feel free to ask any questions. And we'll, we're going to go ahead and get started. What, the way we've kind of structured this program is Sanjeeva is going to start with an overview talk on pulmonary AVMs. And then subsequently, uh, the three of us are going to pre present, each of us are going to present a case and going through some important, you know, technical and clinical pearls. Um, we'll start with the talk uh, with uh, Sanjeeva. Uh, thank you, Ripal. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you all for coming very early in the morning for the session. I'm very excited to share my experience and also talk about pulmonary AVM. Uh, we have been doing this for many years, and the highest has been at UT Southwestern, where we have been doing around 150 AVMs per year. So uh, these are my disclosures. Um, so pulmonary AVMs are structurally abnormal communications between the pulmonary arteries and pulmonary veins with no intervening capillary network, may be associated with a venous sac at the communication site. They vary in size and complexity. They create a right-left shunt uh, leading to no, no gas exchange or capillary uh, filtration. So they occur at a rate of 1 in 2,600 individuals. Majority have HHD. 65% of patients who have pulmonary AVMs are ultimately diagnosed with HHD, whereas patients known to have HHD have somewhere between 50%, 90% incidence of AVMs in the lung. They're always present at birth. Uh, they complete development by adult life. They can enlarge during pregnancy or with altered pulmonary hemodynamics, as in PE or chronic pulmonary thromboembolic disease. So HHT is a multi-system disorder. Um, it's an angiodysplastic disorder inherited as autosomal dominant disease trait with haploid insufficiency. There are two uh, areas which are common, which is uh, an ENG mutation in a chromosome 9 and uh, ALK1 mutation in chromosome 9. These are the most common type of HHT, and the First one is most commonly associated with pulmonary AVMs. Others are less common, and all of these mutations are affecting the TGF beta or BMP9 pathway, leading to mesenchymal cell changes and forming abnormal uh, dysplasia in the vessels, leading to telangiectasias, epistaxis, pulmonary AVM, cerebral or hepatic AVMs. So these dysplastic lesions lead to uh, nose bleeds, gastrointestinal bleeds, and anemia, which is happened to be the most common presentation with HHT patients. Pulmonary AVMs can lead to paradoxical emboli, brain abscess, stroke, hemoptysis, or hemothorax. Cerebral AVMs can lead to stroke. Hepatic AVMs are extremely rare, and if they do occur, they usually present with cardiac failure, but rarely they can lead to portosystemic encephalopathy. Usually, the patients with HHT tend to live shorter life than normal patients without HHT. It is more prominent after 30 years of age, and it is more likely common in women who have ENG mutation because of pulmonary AVM complications. So overall, the median life is around 63 years in patients with HHT, where a patient without HHT is 70 years. Overall epidemiology is one in four patients tend to present with paradoxical emboli or brain abscess or myocardial infarction. One in three have severe migraine, nosebleeds, respiratory cardiac symptoms. One in 100 women in pregnancy tend to die because of bleeding pulmonary AVM. The disease burden is quite high. The pathophysiology of symptoms is mainly because of uh, no gas exchange at the pulmonary AVM level. So decreased oxygen content in the blood leads to increased hemoglobin and increased cardiac output. Patients present with shortness of breath, clubbing, palpitations, cardiac failure, or migraine. Lack of pulmonary filtration through the capillary network leads to paradoxical emboli, 
and the fragile pulmonary avian walls lead to rupture and hemoptysis and hemothorax. So most of the pulmonary AVMs are simple, where a single pulmonary artery communicates directly with the pulmonary vein without intervening capillary network. So those tend to have happened in 90% of the individuals. When multiple feeders or multiple venous drainages occur, they tend to be called complex AVMs, and they occur in 5% of individuals. And then rest 5%, they tend to be diffused in one entire segment or entire lobe, where surgical resection is the only treatment options in those patients. So let us briefly discuss how to diagnose them, how to manage them before we go into cases. However you diagnose them, either because of symptoms or hemoptysis or hemothorax, or because of paradoxal embolus, or incidentally picked up on a chest x-ray, or following screening of a family member, once you suspect HHD, all these patients should undergo one single CT, either non-contrast or contrast to diagnose pulmonary AVM. This single CT can be replaced with contrast echocardiography if there is a good echocardiographer in the hospital. Once pulmonary AVMs are diagnosed on the CT, patients should be advised about antibiotic prophylaxis for dental procedures, keeping up iron well, exercise, and cautions about pregnancy and scuba driving, and uh, management of stroke if they do occur uh, during the fall. All patients with pulmonary AVMs should be treated with embolization procedure, Surgery is rarely, rarely required, and they must be followed for HHT symptoms and a management of HHT in terms of nosebleeds or gastrointestinal bleeds. Once pulmonary AVM is embolized, you can follow them with echocardiography or chest X-ray and try to avoid CT as much as possible. So a single CT is now methodology to diagnose pulmonary AVM. This is an example of a CT. I usually, uh, once obtained a CT, I usually obtain a sub-volume, thin section, MIP, so you can see the arterial flow and the venous drain a single image as in this case, in addition to the venous sac. Contrast echocardiography is very useful, but it is a screening test. It is not diagnostic unless it is grade four shunt. The way it is diagnosed is you inject uh, agitated saline into the IV. First, these bubbles appear in the right atrium. If the bubbles appear in the left atrium within three heartbeats, then it is considered as positive. If the bubbles are very scanty, like less than 20, it is mild, or if it is more than that, it's moderate. If it's extensive, it is grade three or grade four. Usually grade three and grade four have almost always have a pulmonary AVM on a CT, whereas grade one never has a pulmonary AVM on CT. Grade two has 25% chance of finding a pulmonary AVM on CT. So if you find a grade one uh, positivity, you can ignore, you don't have to get a CT and you're done with that. If there is a grade two to four, then you always get a CT to identify the location of the AVM and the number of the AVMs. So uh, pulmonary angiography is reserved as a part of the treatment, is rarely used for diagnosis. For the matter of fact, CT is much superior than pulmonary angiography for diagnosing uh, these uh, AVMs. So which AVMs we should treat? In adult patients, all AVMs should be treated, whether they're symptomatic or asymptomatic, mainly because they pose the risk of stroke because secondary to paradoxical embolism. Uh, there is no three-mem rule. Uh, if you identify a pulmonary AVM, you should treat them if you can get to there. Uh, there is uh, no distinction between three mm feeding artery versus smaller than three mm. In one study, 25% of brain abscesses in patients' pulmonary AVMs occurred when the pulmonary AVM feeding artery was less than two millimeter in diameter. So there is no relationship with 3 mm or less to stroke occurrence. In children, on the other hand, you treat only symptomatic PAVM because paradoxal embolism in children is extremely rare, and you want to avoid radiation uh, dose to children. And these pulmonary AVMs are growing in the child under adulthood, so if you embolize them, they tend to grow after embolization, recanalization, reperfusion is much common in children. And almost all pulmonary avians can be treated with uh, embolization procedure. Surgical resection is required only for diffuse lobar or segmental avian or a very, very large feeding artery where there is no embolic material to plug it. What are the benefits of embolization? Instantaneously, almost all patients improve in terms of oxygenation. Improved oxygenation leads to uh, decreased um, hemoglobin and decreased cardiac output in this patient as a uh, harmonious mechanism for uh, changes in hemodynamics, and there is decreased incidence of stroke and migraine after the procedures. 
So what are the principles of embolization? You always occlude the feeding artery as close as possible to the fistulous communication and you should achieve adequate occlusion of all feeding arteries, not just the one bigger one. Every, every feeding artery should be occluded and no need to occlude the venous sac or venous outflow and we always give IV heparin to prevent intraprocedural stroke which can occur in 1% of individuals. Uh, we always get an EKG to the left bundle branch or creatinine value to make sure patient kidney function is maintained. We always get baseline uh, pulmonary uh, oxygen saturation levels. We don't do under GA, we always do under local or mild sedation of these procedures. Various embolic materials have been used for this treatment, coils, amplature plug, uh, MVP and other plug. So various techniques have been described when using coils or plugs. So in the first uh, instance where a scaffolding technique where the coils are placed in a very, very tight pack to prevent recanalization or uh, use the anchoring technique to prevent prolapse into the sac or you can also use amplage plug very nicely and then coil behind amplage plug has also been described. So this is an example of a, um, a left lung pulmonary AVM, very simple AVM, single feeding artery, single draining vein, a small venous sac. Here we used a 5 French uh, compi catheter to go reach there and then use a 5 millimeter amplage plug through a regular 5 French catheter and this is the MVP that has been used here, um, there, here and the plug there. And it's a very successful occlusion, immediate occlusion. The main advantage of MVP is it, both 3mm and 5mm plugs can be delivered through micro catheter and regular uh, 5 French catheters whereas 7 and 9mm can be deployed through 5 French catheters. They are fully detachable, reposition can be performed, they are very easy to detach, uh, simple attachment technique, they cause immediate occlusion, they do not have to wait for it to thrombose, it is absolute immediate and there are no artifacts on fluoroscopy or CT to assess recanalization, post embolization. There is substantial reduction of radiation dose mainly because you are not using tons of coils to coil them, a single one plug you are done with that. So this is an example of a pulmonary AVM in the right uh, lower lobe where uh, there is a single feeding artery and a single draining vein, a small venous sac. You can see well, we, can, we put a microvascular plug. Here this is the uh, uh, central reconstruction of the AVM here where you can see the feeding artery, AVM and the draining vein. Here we put the plug, the plug can be very nicely seen on a CT and you don't see any contrast going through the plug or beyond the plug on the CT. So there are no artifacts with MVP, very nicely you can see reconstruction if it does occur. Uh, how do I follow up? Most of the patients get contrast echocardiography after six months period of time. If it is negative, we are done with this, we follow up three years period of time. If it is positive, then we get a CT scan to confirm that there is no reconstruction. If it does, then you go back and treat them and start the recycle again. And what are the frequency of reperfusion of the AVMs with the coils the described rate is 20%. And the factors that affect recanalization of single coil or oversizing of the coils, large feeding arteries or proximity to coils, uh, sac proximity to the coils. MVP is less common, 5% to 10%, more with type 1 and type 2 plugs. AVP with uh, coils is less than 1%. Um, this is our data at Southwestern Medical Center. In the last one year, we did 157 AVMs. Uh, in those cases, MVP had a 2% recanalization rate with a median fall of 500 days, AVP 15%, AVP with coils and 20%, and the coils 50%. Uh, these are the, within the same patient, meaning the same patients had MVP 1, one coil one AVM, other AVMs had AVP, other AVMs had uh, coils. So it's, it's intra-patient variations there. So the patient who had a coil placement and recanalized, which was accelerated with an MVP here placed proximal to the coils. So whenever you place uh, AV, uh, MVP proximal to coils, make sure you don't shovel the plug into the coils because the plug doesn't open well. So make sure it is proximal to the coils. So in conclusion, pulmonary AVMs and HST are also a significant moderate and mortality. Embolization is treatment of choice. MVP is well suited for treatment of pulmonary AVMs. Thank you. I'm happy to take any questions if there are. I have, a, I have a question. Um, <clears throat> so the majority of the causes in the literature of treatment failure have been due to recanalization of the pulmonary AVMs. Is it, but the, but the, uh, 
the MVP is PTFE encoded, and the recanalization rate that you uh, just demonstrated there was very, very low. So, is it the what is the perspective of people on this uh, panel that it, do you think the MVP has solved the recanalization problem of pulmonary AVMs? Do we think that that is the case? So, as I said, um, currently we have close to 500 days meet and follow up. Whereas if you take coils, we have five-year follow-up. So time will tell how the short-term or intermediate-term results are going to hold in the long term. So some data which showed 20% uh, recanalization rates with coils tend to be 50% at five years' time. So time will tell us. Second thing is uh, there is a distinct advantage of PTFE. Maybe it isn't allowing uh, the vessel to expand because the finite null plug is approximating well to the wall. It isn't expanding the uh, the wall to allow either bronchial recanalization or a flow trying to go through the coils. Uh, there is something that's happening with the PTFE and this finite null plug which isn't allowing the vessel expansion and recanalization. And the other thing is one thing we have to understand is how often the recanalization that we are, which are assuming is true recanalization or because of uh, other fetus coming into. There are a couple of cases where we thought recanalized AVM and it turned out to be a venous backfilling from the venous side. So we had to be very cautious when it's a recanalization. Some, some people sometimes, I think Miles, can, uh, uh, you said before, it could be reperfusion or persistence of AVM. Uh, I think that's an. I'm sorry, I would say from our data, we have a 0% recanalization of MVP, but there is a different discrepancy, right? So if you look at the initial release of MVP, it was for the smaller plugs. And in general, smaller PAVMs recanalize less because there's less probably antigenic release that brings in neogenesis, right? The larger plugs came out later, so we even have shorter data on those plugs, mm -hmm. and they none of them reached the, the full size of other devices, right? Mm -hmm. So. For, for the vast majority of PAVMs, I think MVP can fit. Mm -hmm. And I think when you can deploy them so far, it looks like there's very low recanalization. Mm -hmm. But you have to take that data with, with a grain of salt. A, it's a shorter follow-up time. And B, in general, if you look at the mean size of the feeding vessel, in all the published work, whether it's yours or ours or anyone else's, it's generally smaller than for AVP and COIL because we just didn't have the product when we started embolizing. And, and clearly, look, we, we need the long-term data, but I think if you're going to use a microvascular plug, it's really key to actually size the plug appropriately to the size of the vessel. If you're going to go off of the IFU, basically, you know, MVP3 is, you know, up to a 3-millimeter vessel, MVP5 up to, you know, 3 to 5-millimeter vessel. It's when you're going off of the IFU, that's when you're going to likely to see, you know, more reperfusion potentially in the future or, or, or even complications. I'm going to move on to the next, uh, we're going to go to the case presentation uh, next uh, for the sake of time. Um, I'm going to be presenting a case, uh, pulmonary AVM, and we'll go through, you know, some of these uh, topics and we could, you know, discuss this a little bit more. So uh, this is a 39-year-old uh, gentleman, uh, currently asymptomatic. He had a history of Osler weber rondeau syndrome, uh, HHT. Uh, he underwent prior uh, coil embolization of a left lower lobe pulmonary AVM about five years ago. And then a uh, patient presented uh, with a follow-up um, CT and subsequently for angiogram for persistent flow here. So here is our uh, pulmonary angiogram. So, um, so you can see these coils which were placed. Um, you know, these were actually placed in uh, Baltimore. Um, you know, uh, Cliff, uh, you know, why, why, why did you do such a poor job on this embolization here? I mean, this could have been Bob White as far as I know. I mean, you, aren't you a little older than I <laughs> I have no, I mean, uh, uh, you know, many people live in Baltimore. <laughs> I was completely joking, completely joking. And having said that, they're very well packed. It's yeah. not like they didn't do a good job. They did a good job. I think the reperfusion can happen. The anchoring, so. the anchoring coil. Yeah. It's a, it might be a little far from the nidus, but it might be, you know, not, not bad. Yeah, you know, I, think, I think that's the, my main criticism. That, you know, I think it's maybe a little bit far from the nidus, mm -hmm. but, you know, there, there's, there's fairly decent uh, packing there. So, you know, I mean, obviously we have a lot of different options of, you know, treating this, you know, reperfused uh, pulmonary AVM. You know, Miles, uh, you know, how, what would be your uh, treatment of choice here? Well, uh, there's a couple options. The, you can do, you, you can back it up with, an, with a single MVP and just walk away. <clears throat> You'd have to land it distal to that takeoff of that uh, other lower lobe artery there. The other option you can do is try to get in there try to fill it 
with additional coils or try to, the best would be to get beyond it. Um, you know, there's a paper where, you know, just really looked at patterns of persistence, uh, you know, following treatment and, you know, retreatment success. And again, majority of these cases uh, were actually due to reperfusion. You know, reperfusion occurred in 91%. Um, but, you know, the, it's actually the cases of the pulmonary to pulmonary reperfusion, which are much more difficult to treat, uh, as was mentioned. Um, but I think the key is, you know, if we can achieve better success, you know, whether it's via denser packing of coils or via, you know, microvascular plug or other agents, you know, we could probably decrease, you know, retreatment uh, over time. Um, so anyway, in, in this case, you know, you know, taking a look here, you know, there's a little bit of, you know, feeding artery, you know, proximal to this coil pack. So basically, you know, what I chose to do here is actually place a, a microvascular plug, which was, you know, well-sized. Um, you know, I, I, the key was here to preserve the pulmonary branches, you know, proximal um, to that. And the very nice thing, if you don't have a lot of experience uh, with this plug, is you can actually inject around the microcatheter without actually deploying the actual microvascular plug. And, and I think that is, a, you know, a very nice feature of this technology. You, know, you really can't do that with any of other, other coils. So this angiogram right here is actually through the microcatheter prior to deployment. If I didn't like it, I could pull it out or, you know, place it somewhere else. And I, I think that's definitely, you know, a nice thing with this technology. You know, one thing, you know, you brought up, Sanjeeva, during your talk. So, you know, you said, you know, you do not embolize the, the actual venous sac. And there are certainly some studies out there looking at that. And some people even claim that maybe that's a better treatment option, although I don't think there's as much data. Okay. You know, any comments uh, from your, the panel on that technique? I think some of that's historical. Right? So, so originally, um, the devices that we had to treat this, and this is, predates me, were stiffer and had an actual risk of damaging the sac and causing a, a, a large complication. Um, I'm not sure, and I've, been, I've heard things from different, different folks from HHT that, that some are moving more towards getting some coils in the sack and coiling back because we have softer, more controllable devices that we can actually have complete control of before we, we let go. It's no longer a GTC coil that you put in and have to wait five minutes or three minutes for it to deploy. And you have really good control right now, and it's not shootable or pushable coils. And so some people are embolizing the sac. We don't in particular, because we still follow a couple older guidelines, but it, it may be coming down the pike, and that might be a way to spare more lung tissue and to get a decreased rates of, of long-term reperfusion and persistence. It's possible. I think, Miles, any experience with that? I think sac embolization is a good option. If you have a very short landing zone for your feeding artery, and you don't think you're going to have an adequate coil pack to achieve maximal density, or you don't think it's 1.2 centimeters to land an MVP. In that case, I just don't feel like I've really bulked up the feeding artery embolization enough, so therefore I'll do the sac embolization now. And the second thing is when you start embolizing some of these sacs, you're going to be there all day. Yep. You know? <laughs> and okay, I, think, I, think, I think that's a great comment. Uh, I'd like to make two comments. Uh, one thing is, if we decide to use um, coils to fill the sac, it could be a good option when a, a branch vessel is coming very close to this uh, feeding artery, closer to the sac. So most of the reperfusions occur because this branch vessel is coming back into the sac. So if you can get a plug in uh, distal to the branch vessel, then sac coil packing may be a good option. Uh, second comment about this one is, we have done a few of the recanalized pulmonary AVM with microvascular plug. I think our habit has always been to shove the microcatheter into the coil pack and put more coils inside to pack it well. If we use the same mechanism to put the microvascular plug, what I have seen is the distal part of the cone of microvascular plug doesn't open well, and actual reperfusion rates are much higher if you use MVP inside the coil plug. So always use the plug just proximal to the coil so that the entire plug can open well. I think those are great comments. You know, for the sake of time, I'm going to you know, try to move through the rest of this so we could you know, move on to the additional uh, case presentations. But this is the immediate uh, angiogram post-embolization, you know, which shows you know, immediate uh, occlusion of this vessel with a single microvascular plug with preservation of the adjacent pulmonary arterial branches.
just very quickly, this is you know, one paper which was published uh, you know, uh, this year, just looking at the success of the microvascular plug. Mean feeding diameter was 2.3 millimeters, and uh, you know, at a mean follow-up about a year, you know, 94% of pulmonary AVMs were occluded. There were two persistent uh, pulmonary AVMs, and one was due to recanalization. If you actually look at the feeding artery in that case, it was 4.1 millimeters, and the actual and they placed the MVP3. This is you know just going off of IFU. You know, this is probably the best case scenario for this patient. You know, if you go power IFU, so use an MVP5. So I would call that really a technical issue in terms of uh, you know device selection. The second one was secondary to pulmonary artery, um, the pulmonary artery, um, you know, connection. Uh, clearly, you know, as we discussed, we do need longer-term data, but uh, you know, these initial success rates are, you know, pretty promising uh, to say the least. Um, you know, I think Sanjeeva commented on this uh, nicely. You know, artifact. Um, you know, just showing this, is, this happens to be a GDA embolization that I did, but showing you pretty much ab complete absence of artifact um, with the microvascular plug compared to coils. This is. Uh, you know, case in the literature, again, showing the absence of artifact on imaging. I think this was already covered by Sanjeeva, so just, you know, I think the real key here is that the, the most recent guidelines really say you should basically treat, you know, any size pulmonary AVM. Less than three is completely appropriate, and they often do lead to paradoxical emboli. So I think that three millimeter rule is really a relic of the past. Um, just a couple of quick technical tips and tricks. You could read this article that we wrote, you know, with some of uh, more detail, but basically, you know, use an air filter. One of the things that we tell, um, you know, actually our nursing staff and so forth is um, we've got to be really careful even in, in placing the IV. If you introduce any air and some, you know, some nurses, you know, might be a little bit careless, you know, you know, for your routine patient, it's not going to make a difference. You know, you could end up having a problem. You want to double flush or be hooked up to a continuous flush. We do heparinize our patients to minimize the risk of thrombus formation. And, um, and I think we talked about some of the, you know, tips and tricks, you know, really dense packing or coil plugging, you know, very close um, to the sac or potentially the sac itself. Um, and, you know, I think you don't really want to skimp on embolic agent in these cases. You know, hopefully if you have a very dense pack of coils or you place a plug, hopefully you will not have to come back. And then finally, if you're treating patients who have multiple pulmonary AVMs, you know, maybe you don't want to go crazy and try to treat every, everybody, every single uh, pulmonary AVM in one setting, which could require a lot of contrast and radiation exposure. Thank you. I'm going to move, why don't we move on to the next uh, talk. Uh, I think um, uh, Cliff uh, Weiss is going to be presenting a case, uh, which I think is going to be uh, very interesting. So this is a long case, so feel free to cut me off and move on when we need to. Um, and I, I love participation from the audience as we go through, because this is about as com complex as, as, as it gets in terms of a kid. And this is a 14-year-old who came to the ED. Um, actually, he was seen by his pediatrician at clubbing on examination and walking around in, at, at, on room air. It was approximately 68% saturation. Um, when I mean he reported dyspnea on, with, with athletics, he's a lacrosse player. We're Maryland. We play a lot of lacrosse in Maryland. He would run 10 feet, have to stop, take a few breaths, then run 10 feet, stop, take a few breaths. Um, he also had severe epistaxis a couple times a week, um, and somehow his family knew they had a history of HHT and did not realize that, didn't think to screen him, but they sent him to the emergency department when they realized he was saying 68%. And in the ED, um, you know, he was a very skinny kid, uh, had severe clubbing, um, blue lips, blue fingers, he was completely hypoxic and, um, you know, had, a, had an elevated hemoglobin. So this chest x-ray is, is pretty scary because you can see on chest x-ray the mass in his left lower lobe. And thank God people in the emergency department were aware enough of the hypoxia and the mass to not order anything silly. They just got a CAT scan. And what we can see is, is he's got a massive uh, hypervascular mass in the left lower lobe, and then throughout the lungs, you can see a series of other areas, and these end up being uh, massive pulmonary AVMs. And this is actually a, a 3D reconstruction, which demonstrates a pulmonary AVM in the left lower lobe. And you can see, uh, at, at least just in the cut we have there, there's another series of large ones in the right lower lobe as well. So clearly he's hypoxic, and clearly in the left lower lobe, we have a PAVM the size of a golf ball. And so I, I, I'm going to ask the audience, and then I'm going to ask the panel, um, we're going to bring him down to get a, a pulmonary AVM embolization for sure, no matter what. 
um, unless we're going to take him to surgery. But in this case, he had hundreds of PAVMs. He had diffuse PAVMs. Um, are there any precautions beyond what we've spoken of so far that anyone in the audience would take with a 14-year-old on your table with a PAVM the size of a golf ball? Any, any kind of precautions you can think of? And I'm going to just let you know, we, we decided under anesthesia was the safest thing for this 14-year-old because we needed a lot of, we needed him to be still and he was 14 and anxious and hypoxic. So anything in particular you might think of? Sorry? So I would be terrified that in manipulating anything in the left lower lobe pulmonary AVM, we might rupture. Um, so we'll get there in a second. So I want you to notice in the, in the right hand image, the radiologic right, that we have a, a dual uh, bronchus intubation. So I, have a, I, have, I actually have an isolation balloon up on the endotracheal tube on the left, low, left lung. Oh. So in case we, we rupture the AVM, he wouldn't die, right? But also look at the first image and look at the amount of shunt that this kid has. So not only is he hypoxic from his shunt, but he's also shunting blood away from the rest of his lung. So what we actually do in this case is actually we had to drop something really, really large because this was a, uh, this was a, a, a very, very big feeder. And I don't have the measurement. I'll have to put that on the next time. But we end up using a, the, one of the larger devices we had, which was a 16 millimeter AVP2, an Amplatzer plug. And in fact, we actually needed, it was a complex PAVM too. In fact, we needed two very large AVPs, okay? And you'll even notice these aren't distended like you'd normally want an AVP to get great, great apposition. So we barely were covering the size of this vessel to begin with. But at the end of the case, what we see is all of a sudden he's got left lung perfusion and four more PAVMs have shown up, okay? But at the end of this point, we were, we were pretty happy and, and, and we moved on. Um, and, and that basically is the before and after. And in one session, we took him from 70s on room air to 92%. And, and when, when we dropped the plug, his lips went from blue to red. So Cliff, what, what's, what's your strategy in a patient like this? I'm obviously treated the largest pulmonary AVM here. Here's a patient who has multiple, multiple pulmonary AVMs. I mean, is your goal to try to get, I mean, you said, you know, I don't know if you said hundreds of them. I mean, is your goal to try to treat every single one or is it even, even technically feasible? The goal is over a series of, of, of staged events to get him to, uh, I, I'm looking for an oxygen saturation in the high 90s, and I'm looking to embolize, in this case, because he's a child, um, in general, the PAVMs in the t no, nothing smaller than two millimeters, uh, and I try to get as many done as I can before we have to stop. Um, mostly because I want him to regain normal growth. I, he is at extreme risk of paradoxical emboli, and he's an athletic kid who wants to have a life and go do things. And so um, my goal here, as we'll see by the end of this, is to embolize as many as possible over a period of months, slowly. There's no emergency. The emergency's over. Uh, now we want to just get this done slowly over time. And what we can see is he never had bad pulmonary pressures. He's a young guy. He didn't have any, any bad pulmonary hypertension. He had good cardiac output. And, um, and you can see after the first embolization, we have thrombosis of the left lower lobe, um, pulmonary AVM, and an associated small pulmonary infarct, which you have really no choice with this. Um, I will say in our experience, when you do a large PAVM like this in a lower lobe, the risk of systemic recanalization from non-pulmonary vessels is high, probably from a release of, of growth factors. So some of these people, if they're adults, will send for a resection afterwards to prevent you know, celiac or, or um, uh, uh, phrenic artery feeders coming up from outside the lung or even collaterals from the, from the ribs. So, um, so, so, so your approach is a little bit different than Sanjeeva. So you mentioned, you know, you think that the incidence of, you know, paradoxical emboli is much lower in kids. So, I mean, I don't think anybody's going to argue for treating that larger one, but would you have, if you were, would you have followed the other ones? Probably if I had treated this patient, I would have just done that, wait for four years, let him grow 18 years of age, and then bring him back and do other AVMs, mainly because decrease the radiation dose to the kid, and second thing is the risk of paradox lumbola is quite low. The AVMs are still growing over a period of time, so let them grow as much as they can grow until 18 years of age, and then they stabilize and then embolize them. Uh, but nothing wrong in going after them. As a yeah, and, and our sense in this kid was there were enough large pulmonary AVMs after this, I mean, throughout the lung that it was worth embolizing as many as we could up to a point where we felt we were getting below a, a threshold of size. Um, he's, a, he's not a young kid. 
Uh, he's an older kid and um, you know has an extensive uh, number of PAVMs that, and, and was continuing to shunt and, and be hypoxic after the first procedure. Um, Are you concerned about the thrombus in the venous sac after MLI such a big uh, pulmonary AVM? So I'm not really worried about that going anywhere, to be honest with you. I, 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 we've never seen that occur, mm -hmm. and um, it's possible. I mean, that, that could be a, a very worrisome thing, um, but, you know, we, we don't see that in, in PAVMs of almost any size, as far as I can tell. And, and my, my reasoning behind that is when you have zero inflow, you should have no outflow. Now, could it theoretically propagate and, and thrombose a large? Yes, that was a risk uh, of this procedure. Do you but back up AVPs with, with uh, coils? We do not. We do not. Have you had recans through um, AVPs without coils? We have had uh, uh, recans a little lower than the uh, publish, published data. We've, we've certainly had a few recans of uh, amplats or plugs, so you know, I often will throw a coil or two right yeah. at the back end. Yeah, of it. yeah. I've had uh, recans through all uh, ABPs, you know, four and two and everything. So, yeah. We we, we haven't, but we also oversize significantly, so it's possible that might might be the solution. But of course, when you oversize an ABP, it elongates significantly. Yeah. Unlike right. me. So. Right. But to be honest with you, uh, since the MVP has come out, I, uh, my use of ABPs has really been limited to the very largest of the yeah. AVMs. I, I no longer even deliver implants or four into a four millimeter vessel. He had HHT, he had a brain AVM. He left at eight, around 90%. We brought him back a number of times and continued to embolize him. And as you can see, these are not small, right? This is why we continued. It wasn't like we were going after one millimeter uh, 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 PAVMs, and we actually used um, a lot of MVPs and AVPs, and, and you can see as we start to deploy these, the lung gets better and better perfusion, and then by the end, we did 31 PAVMs with 38 embolics. Uh, we did some coil embolization. We did a lot of AVP and a, a great deal of MVP, and by the end of that, we had him stable on room air at 98%, and he spurted all of a sudden. He grew, he became unhypoxic, and he became the size of a normal child. We haven't touched him since, other than to follow him up. And our goal is when he hits his 18s or 20s, we'll reassess him and, and start treating the other pulmonary AVMs or any recanalization that may have occurred from growth. Cliff, um, have, you, have you ever had um, a coil or plug systemically embolize, uh, either you know, during your regular case or in a younger patient like this as they grew, you know, the vessels grew, and, and then, you know, no longer appropriately sized. So our, I will say this patient is a unique patient in the extent of this. Usually it was a child that's with a single or a couple PAVMs. We've never had anybody um, uh, embolize after. And I would imagine that's because these coils and these, these uh, plugs become uh, incorporated into the vessel wall over time. They get endothelialized. Um, I will also say, and I say with, with, with knock on wood because it can happen to any of us, because we're very careful about technique, we've never had a systemic embolization during embolization either. And I've seen reports, especially with pushable coils, of getting systemic embolization. It can happen, uh, and, and it, is, it is skill and it is luck, uh, and it's careful technique. So that, that would be the disaster. And so this is what he looks like. He looks like he's been shot with a very tiny shotgun. By the end of the procedure, he's got coils, and he's got plugs, and he's got AVPs, he's got MVPs. But overall, his lungs look much healthier. And um, we still have, you know, many, many more we will eventually go after, but we're not going to touch him again until he's in his 18s or 20s. So. And then you can see the thrombus in the AVPs, and then overall the perfusion of the lung looks better after the centralization. So. You know, uh, one other comment, you know, I've, I actually have had an amplatz or plug which recanalized, and I had no additional space proximal to the vessel. Yeah. And you can actually put a microcatheter directly into the amplatzer plug and you know, throw some coils directly into the amplatzer plug, you know, which worked well in that uh, setting. Great case. Very, yeah, very, very, very he's, complex. He's everything uh, in, our, in our bag to get it done. Perfect. Okay. So I'm interested in what to do with patients that have persistence from systemic arteries and how to manage complex AVMs that have been uh, recanalized but also reperfused from systemic arteries. So this is the patient. So here you have a left upper lobe complex pulmonary AVM in a, in a 27 year old uh, patient that was treated as a child who has frequent migraines. 
he feels unwell, and he is an uh, avid athlete who lives up, in, up at altitude in the Sierra Nevadas. And he's an ICU nurse, and he keeps checking his O2 sat at work, and it's low, and he knows he has HHT. And years ago, he had this pulmonary AVM embolized, and this is what we all deal with. You look, this is the consequence of, of uh, treating a child with a pulmonary AVM. <clears throat> this kid needs, needed to be treated when he was a child, but it, uh, but it's turned into this monster. And this is one of the reasons that we try to avoid treating children if we can't. So you have this complex AVM with a, with a pretty big sac here, and there's feeding arteries coming from the chest wall. So we look real close, and we can see that this is this situation. We're going to have to back up all these coils, and then we have, so we'll take care of the right to left shunt, but what should we do with the left to left shunt? I mean, should you leave it alone? Should you, uh, the patient's not hemoptysizing, so that would be the main indicator of whether you should treat the left to left shunt. But if you use size criteria in terms of reduction as an indicator of successful treatment, right, you can, you can look at persistence or you can use size reduction of the sac over time to follow an AVM. How do you know if you've effectively treated the AVM if it doesn't re really reduce in, in sac size because of the left to left shunt? So these are difficult cases to follow. Uh, this is what it looks like on the angiography. You have these coils, and you can see that there's this big, big old vein right there. And then there's a systemic artery filling from the thyrocervical trunk with all these collaterals going, going north there, kind of scary. So uh, I guess the question is, you have a situation where you have a complex pulmonary AVM. You know, you know the patient's hypoxic. They have migraines. You're worried about brain abscess and stroke. You know you should treat the, the, the recanalized uh, feeding arteries. Do you treat the systemic artery as well? Or do you just half treat it? Just treat the feeding arteries from the right to left shunt? Do you also address the left to left? What's the, what do you think? So in general, I don't treat systemic artery supply for two reasons. Number one, they do not contribute to paradoxical emboli. They do not contribute to hypoxia. and They don't grow. So the reason they develop, first of all, is because of infarction. Because whenever the pulmonary infarct, there is injury to parietal pleura. The parietal pleura is supplied by systemic arteries, so they connect from parietal pleura to visceral pleura, and they feed back into the pulmonary venous system. They're akin to having any fibrotic disease like uh, cystic fibrosis or tuberculosis, where the fibrous tissue develops in the pleural surface that draws blood from the systemic to the pulmonary venous circulation. So they do not pose any risk of this except for hemoptysis. So unless the presenting symptom hemoptysis, I usually don't treat them. Okay, but how do you follow this AVM over time with imaging? Because you're gonna you're gonna see a, a perfused sac, right? You're gonna say, is that perfusion of that sac due to the systemic artery, or is it due to the pulmonary artery? And that changes your management, right? If it's due to the pulmonary artery, then you, you have a reperfuse. So right that's where we shunt. follow them mainly with um, contrast echocardiography. So if the contrast echocardiography is negative, then you're done. They're yeah. not fed through the right to left shunt. Yeah. If it is positive, then you have to do an angiography because it is not going to help you. Right. So that would but, require you embolizing the left lower lobe pulmonary AVMs first. Uh, yeah, exactly. So, so here's the situation. This is a guy with pulmonary AVMs all over the world, all, all over his lungs, right? He had like 18. So he's always going to have a positive Post, exactly. uh, bubble study, right? So the only thing you can do is follow him with CTs, and this guy is sick of getting CT'd, and he doesn't want to get, he doesn't want me to follow him with pulmonary angiography, right? So it's hard, this is, this is a difficult thing to manage, you know, how do you follow these things? And, you know, the majority of the, uh, of the cases that you're, we're talking about here is recanalization. As we mentioned, I think the MVP has largely solved that problem. Um, the, uh, this is this rare, this is this unlikely case of systemic artery perfusion. You know, we don't see it that often. We try to avoid treating children, although I think you were definitely validated in treating that child that you, you mentioned, Cliff. But uh, the majority of the cases we're seeing, you know, systemic artery reperfusion of pulmonary AVMs, they're infrequent, but they are more li likely to occur uh, typically in peripheral lung fields. Have you all seen a bronchial artery reperfuse 
an HHT pulmonary AVM. Usually, I'm, usually we're seeing it from phrenics and uh, branches from the chest wall. And uh, there's no known rupture rate. Uh, we also subscribe to this belief that you don't need to treat unless the patient has hemoptysis. So basically what the, the goal here is to just reinforce coils. Uh, or, you know, you can put coils in the middle of the old coil pack, uh, or you can get beyond there if you can, get close. Here we did MVPs distally. And um, to do that, we're, we're using sheaths like this because I think this is, uh, this is just, we, we lost the, the white Lumax uh, Cook product, so uh, now we're using just the uh, destination, but but essentially the the key is to not have a rabi or something that has a diaphragm, so that you have improved torqueability. I think the the benefit of the Tui Boris here is that you have this this improved torqueability, which is the key to try to jam these. I, I mean, uh, I mean, gently place these catheters into these arteries beyond coil packs and try to back them up. And so you know you you're putting MVPs. There's an MVP down here in this. In this area, I'm just trying to get as much product in there and get as as uh, as much as I can get there and to, to shut the right uh, the right to left shunt down. And sh what should you do with this monster vein? So there's this procedure called the Brock and Bro procedure, which is basically a uh, you know a transeptal approach to the pulmonary vein. And we talked about that, of course. But then you worry about or the cardiologists were just terrified I was going to cause venous hypertension. Uh, if I did that, would anyone, has anyone here ever embolized a pulmonary AVM from the venous side and do you think it's a good idea or a bad idea? My answer would be no and probably not a great idea. Okay. We didn't do it, uh, but we ended up, you know, I looked at the systemic supply and I'm like, okay, here's a guy that is, it, when I say avid athlete, I mean he is a climber who falls He's fallen directly on his chest from, from a small football bouldering and ended up in an ER. And he's done full uh, crashes on his mountain bike. It's this like crazy thing and he doesn't want surgery. So, you know, I start looking at this thing and I'm just like, okay, well, what should you do with this feeding artery, the systemic artery supply? Here it is right here. So he wants to avoid surgery for as long as possible. And we're worried about rupture from chest, from from uh, trauma. Would everyone just be comfortable watching this pulmonary AVM and letting, leaving the systemic supply alone? It's a challenging situation. Yeah. Uh, I don't think we have any data really. Yeah, but, and it's uncomfortable to half treat an AVM, right? I mean, all of us want to cure an AVM. If we, if we, want, if we see an AVM, we want to take care of the AVM. Mm -hmm. You don't want to half treat an AVM. So, you know, uh, that's basically what we, we generally just tried to leave it alone. At some point, I went up there and I put a, you know, I, I did uh, do an angiogram uh, up there. He really wanted to avoid surgery for as long as possible. And I thought, well, I'll just start kind of looking around. As soon as I embolized one with these concertos up here, everything just started coming to life. And it quickly realized that I was doing something dumb. So I, and then of course you got this, all this blood supply going to the brachial plexus in a young athlete, you really don't want to be there. So the point is, is uh, I would just walked away from that situation after kind of coming close to doing something dumb. But um, I think systemic artery <coughs> perfusion of pulmonary AVMs is an unlikely situation. There's no real consensus. Nobody, know, nobody, people say you shouldn't treat it unless there's some optosis, but in real life situations, you know, it's a complex decision making process. You know, you bring up the transeptal approach, and um, you know we've done it for other applications. You know, once we were treating a systemic AV fistula, and we had coils which, you know, were very close to migrating, and you know, had our cardiology EP guys help us out and transeptal access, and you know, actually get into there. Something to consider. Um, clearly, there's uh, you know not much written on it, and. You know, probably going to need uh, some help from some of our uh, colleagues in cardiology to do that, but um, you know, it's not an unreasonable thing to consider. Yeah, there, there have been times when we've treated systemic to pulmonary artery uh, PAVM uh, collaterals if the cardiac output was also high. Right. right. In this case, because of the left to left shunt. Yeah. Right. In this case, it doesn't seem like that was the case. Right. But and that is another thing. If you're seeing these shunts, check your cardiac output. Because yep. you can't get into high Absolutely. 
high output failure, and in those cases, you're obligated to do something. Yeah. Whether that's a surgical resection or that's more likely than not a systemic embolization, uh, you, you start to become quickly. Yeah. Yeah. There, there are some there are some data right now that anti-angiogenic agents after embolization of even systemic AVMs can decrease this VEGF and HIF alpha burst and can decrease the rate of recanalization or reperfusion or whatever you call mm -hmm. it. I would call it in the periphery, you know, revascularization re of yeah. the In this case, no. I don't know that there's data for that, but something to consider yeah. in embolizing. I've seen a couple of case reports, actually, some presentations, people you've been using, you know, vast and uh, mm -hmm. any experience on using any of these agents? And uh, I, yeah, you know, I have a kid uh, who has AVMs all over, all over the place, and each one is like a millimeter in, in size. And you can, you know, it's going back to your kid, you can go there and you could spend hours and days and days and days and, and uh, weeks doing, doing these little, tiny little pulmonary AVM embolizations. And uh, so I called around and I was like, is anyone using AVAS? And I got in the HHT uh, professional forum and I've called all over. And, uh, you know, there's, people are looking into it particularly with the oral meds like pazopinib and, and uh, other things. And I think in the future, we are going to reach a point, probably within five years, we'll be up on a, on a panel like, like this, and we'll be talking about using one of the monoclonal antibodies on diffuse pulmonary AVMs. And, and, there, and it, 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 it's showing more and more now that in the genetic pathway of systemic AVMs, there are actually cross pathways with things like um, the same mutation pathway as, as skin cancer, as melanoma. And so some of the melanoma drugs in animal models have been shown to melt some of these AVMs away. Again, we're a decade away. Oh, yeah. We're even oh, yeah. close, but sure. in, in, the, in, in the vascular anomalies world, people are thinking more along oncologic pathways for these at some point. So at some point, we may be out of business. But these patients currently are mostly on Avastin, mainly to prevent bleeding from the nose and J tract. It may be good to see, go back and look at the data to see patients who are, had PAV embolization and are on Avastin versus who were not our best, and that any repercussion or difference among these populations. So. Uh, absolutely, and, and yeah. along those lines, if they've had smaller pulmonary AVMs, was there any regression over Correct. time when you're following yeah. some of those patients? So it will be a great study to take a look at. Uh, so what, what, with this patient, so where, where, where does this So we're just at a, I'm at a situation where he uh, doesn't want to get surgery because he, he doesn't want to lose X percent of his uh, aerobic capacity, and he just wants me to watch him. And, mm -hmm. And uh, so I'm intermittently getting, you know, CTs and going from there. But it's true, you can't tell based on the CT. It's pretty hard to tell if it's reperfused from the, from yeah. the right to left shunt or the left to left. And that, that is the big issue here is these are very hard to follow because they're all positive on bubble. Any questions uh, from the audience? And the question is, you know, looking at adults versus children and whether embolization of the sac makes a difference. I don't know any data that shows that either way. There isn't much data on it, but we all believe that AVM is going to grow under adulthood. So our assumption is the feeding artery would grow, sac would grow, the vein would grow. So we will not be that enthusiastic to embolize those AVMs unless the patient is symptomatic. The, the answer to that is not really known, but, uh, but it is funny when I talk to my neuro IR colleagues about, hey, I'm going to go and embolize a feeding artery, and they just laugh at how juvenile I am because they are, they're so obsessed with getting the, the feeding artery, the nidus, or the sac, and a draining vein, you know, when they do brain AVMs. And, and uh, so, yeah, we're, we're more interested in, we're not, we're not jumping on that bandwagon and embolizing the sac in kids yet, but it is, a, it is something that everyone talks about. You know, at the HHC meetings, they say, should we embolize the sac in children because of the reperfusion risk is so high. And it, there was an abstract in uh, a couple of years ago that showed up to 70% of children uh, have reperfusion of their pulmonary AVMs. And the majority of that is due to recanalization, which again is probably solved by the MVP. And I think the comment that uh, you made, Cliff, you know, with regards to the technology that we have today. I think it's mu probably going to be much safer, and I think we might see more, you know, data along those lines, and actually embolization of the sac. Any other questions? 
Well, great. I want to thank you all uh, for you know coming to this breakfast session. I want to thank the panel for being here. Um, the uh, the general session of ISED actually starts in about ten minutes, uh, or eight minutes at eight twenty. I hope to see you all there. Thank you.